This program comes to you compliments of the Tobago Inspirational Network. To support this and other programs, we encourage you to give to TIN. Contributions can be made at any First Citizens Bank at account number 2034679. We thank you for your support. Greetings in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. This is your program, Living by the Word. And I'm yours truly, Pastor Eloise Hines. And I just want to welcome you to another time of interaction in the Word of God. We have been talking to you about the sovereignty of God. But before we get into our message for today, I just want to extend, of course, um, happy Mother's Day greetings. I know this is probably getting to you after Mother's Day, but happy Mother's Day greeting to all of you who tune in, whether you're in Tobago, Trinidad, you're the United States of America, you're in Guyana, or wherever you are, on behalf of the Tobago Inspirational Network, of course, the ministry, myself, and those that are connected with me, the Christian Solidarity Family, we just want to declare the blessings of the Lord upon you to strengthen you and to keep you to continue doing what you're doing, that the grace of God will cause success in your life in this role as a mother in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. Father, thank you for your people. We declare your word going forth today. will challenge. It will draw somebody that needs to know you into the fold. And Father, at the end of it all, we all will give you the honor, the glory, and the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We continue talking about the sovereignty of God. And remember, I've been saying to you that the sovereignty of God means that God has ultimate power and right and authority to do what he wants to do, how he wants to do it. But because God is love and because God loves us, whatever God does, it's not about um, taking advantage of us. It's not about any selfish means. It's not for God to big up himself and say, look, I am God. Who are you? But whatever God does, it is because it is in the highest level of integrity according to his very name. Um, the word of God says God is love. And therefore, he cannot do anything that will betray his very nature as one of love. In spite of him being sovereign and having power to do as he wills. Whatever God does, it is well done. My God, we may not understand it. But this is who we are talking to you about today. Last time we talked about the sovereignty of God in creation. And we saw where God formed the world in which we live. In fact, the writer of Hebrews says to us, by faith we understand that the world was framed by the word of God so that what now exists did not come from something that previously existed. And when you look at the account in Genesis, you see where the writer records and God said, and God said, and God said. And then I said to us last time that in Mark chapter 11, Jesus said, if you will say to the mountain, be thou removed and be thou cast in the sea and do not doubt in your heart. But if you will believe that what you have said that you will have it. You too will have what you say. And I'm challenging you as you look at this program. Begin to speak what you want. Maybe it is the things you're getting is what you've been speaking. So the negativity coming into your life is because that's what you've been confessing. Come on, you've been saying, I will never get married. I will never get a promotion. That house is not for me. That this is not. And you begin to, you have been shaping your very world by the words that you have been speaking. And it's time that you begin to say what you want. Just as God spoke and we saw the universe as it's recorded in Genesis, materialize. I declare to you today, as you begin to speak, you're going to see a manifestation of those things that you're decreeing and declaring come to pass in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. The thing about it is that we speak 
a lot of things, but do we speak what we really want to see? Hallelujah. In spite of what you see facing you, my goodness, begin to speak what God will have you to speak. Begin to say, the Bible tells us that the power of life and death is in the tongue. And he has given us the authority to decree a thing and see it come to pass. That woman whose son was dead. Hallelujah. That woman had so much faith. Come on, she jumped on her chariot and she took off going towards the man of God. And when she was asked, is everything well? She, she declared, it is well. She's leaving her dead son home. Oh my goodness, pronounced dead. And she is still declaring, it is well. Until she gets to the man of God and maybe gets another prognosis, she declares, it is well. And whatever situation you're facing, continue to speak. I have learned that. My goodness. I have learned to say that. It's a, it's a line that I have picked up that sometimes you, you get all sorts of negative reports. And the only thing you can say is it is well. It is well in spite of what I see. Lord, I declare it is well. Bible tells us in Romans that all things are going to work together for good to those who love the Lord, for those who are the called according to his purpose, for whom he, he did foreknow, he did predestine to be conformed to the image of his dear son. We declare today, whatever situation you're facing, uh, I agree with you, the prayer of agreement, I continue to agree with you that it is, is well in the name of Jesus. And then today we want to continue talking about the sovereignty of God as it relates to God dealing with sin. You see, we see so many things happening in the world and we see people redefining sin. But I want to tell you that sin is what God alone says it is. When we sin, we sin against God's laws because that's what sin is. It's the transgression of what God has set up for us to obey. And sin comes in when we go against what God says. When when we violate God's principles, his word, his instructions, and do our own thing. It is sin. The Bible tells us also that all unrighteousness is sin. And I want to look at God's sovereignty, having all power to exercise as he chooses. How does God choose to deal with sin in his sovereign power? Genesis chapter 2. The Bible tells us in verse 15 to 17 that God had made Adam and God said to him in, in, in verse 15, he said, the Lord God took the man. He put him in the garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. And the Lord God commanded the man. He says, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden. <clears throat> But you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat from it, you will certainly die. That was God's sovereign power. God put the man in the garden and God gave an instruction and God says, this is what I'm telling you to do. There are trees galore, as we say. There are a variety of trees. My goodness, God says, eat as much as you want. Nothing is going to be taken back or withholding from you. Eat all of it. But God says, I'm telling you, there is one single tree of all the variety of trees. God says, don't eat from that one. And I tell you, isn't it the same thing with us today that God has given us so much liberty. God has given us so much freedom. And the one thing that God says, do not do, that is the thing we want to do. Come on. You know, we have um, so many laws in our, la in our nation. And, and there's one particular law as it relates to the use of marijuana. And now there are so many persons going into research to say, that is the one we want. <laughs> because that one that we are told not to partake of is what will bring healing. <laughs> That's the one. 
God says you can live. Come on, you can travel. You can have a career. You can fly wherever you want to fly. Make friends. Meet people. Do all of it. Enjoy life. God says, however, there are certain things I'm telling you not to do. God says, if you want to get sexually involved, get married. I'm not telling you don't do it, but commit to the person. We said, no, God, you're too hard. You know, we have a saying down in Trinidad and Tobago, we're not buying cat in bag. But look at this society. Look at where we are today as a society. And I know we don't want to talk about it, but we got to talk about it. Look at where we are. The forbidden thing that God says, don't taste, don't partake, isn't it what we want? Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. God has given us all the liberties, just like he gave Adam. And the very thing that God says, leave alone, that's the thing we are running after. That's the one we're saying, God, you're unfair. I want to live my life. Oh, I want to live my life. And God told Adam, don't do that. By Genesis chapter 3, what happens? The serpent beguiles Eve. Eve now sees that the, this fruit is so good to make one wise. She takes, she eats, she gives her husband. And I want you to see God's sovereignty in how he deals with the first um, human beings who disobey him. The Bible tells us in Genesis chapter 3, verse 8, that God came down, walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And what happened? He found that man began hiding from him. And I'm saying to us up to today, mankind still hides from the presence of God. Hallelujah. You would sit at home, come on, doing, you know, just maybe looking at us. But we invite you and we say, come fellowship. And there are some persons who will tell you, no, I'm not coming. <laughs> Anything related to God and God's presence, I don't want any part of it. I'm saying to you, sir, I'm saying to you, madam, it did not just start today. <laughs> Since man sinned against God, man has been avoiding the presence of God. But I'm saying to you, because of what Christ has done, and I'm jumping ahead of myself, you can come boldly to God. You can come just as you are. You can come surrendering yourself your life to him because he has made a way possible through the blood of Jesus. I'm jumping ahead of myself, but I'm saying it. You don't have to run and hide from God anymore. You don't have to be afraid when you mess up to come into his presence because of what Christ has done. But look at how God deals with them in his sovereign power. God is judge, jury, and executioner, <laughs> as we say. Come on, the Bible tells us that in verse 14, the Lord God said to the serpent, because you done this, you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and all wild animals. You will crawl on your belly. You will eat dust all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. God decide to judge the serpent who beguiled Eve. I want you to see God's sovereign power to work as judge of all the earth. And I'm saying to you, people of the living God, there is coming a day when we too will stand before God to give an account of our lives. And we would not be standing before him then as father, as the man upstairs, as, as God, and all of the things we use so flippantly. We will stand before him as judge to give an account of what we've done in this life. But God says to the serpent, listen, I'm going to put enmity between you and the woman. Because the friendly, friendly thing is what got her into the problem. But I'm going to cause enmity to come. I'm saying to you, sometimes God has to allow us to part ways with certain people to protect us. My God. Hallelujah. God has to move us away from some people and some situations to preserve us. And he says, I'm going to cause the seed of the woman to crush his head. And that was talking about Jesus. God says, I'm going to bring some, a descendant from Eve who will deal with you once and for all. Jesus, the writer says in 1 John 3, 8, he says, for this purpose was the son of man manifested that he might destroy the work of the wicked one. Hebrews 2 and 14, I think it is talking about Jesus coming to defeat the one who had the power of death over us. 
This is what was spoken way back in Genesis. God decreed it. It came to pass. That is the power of our God. Not only that, he told the woman, of course, her desire will be to her husband. He will rule over her. And he said to the man, listen, hey, from the ground, you are going to work hard. The sweat of your brow, you will eat bread. And that is God's power. And he said to them, furthermore, he said, listen, you, they were banished from the garden. Because he said he did not want them to take now of the tree of life and live in a rebellious state against him. That is the sovereignty of God dealing with sin. Adam couldn't put up a fuss after that. I keep saying when God decrees and God speaks, nobody can come and say, God, what are you doing? The serpent had to take his punishment. Eve had to take her punishment in sorrow for childbirth up to today. And man, because he listened to his wife and took off this fruit of the tree that God told him not to, up to today by the sweat of man's brow, he had to work so hard to eat a little bit of bread. God spoke it. And that's what we see manifested up to now. And we see the sovereignty of God. What did God do? We see by Genesis chapter 6, we see the flood. Yes, when the world had gotten so very corrupt. And what did God do? God says, I'm going to set a flood. I'm going to wipe out everything that's outside this ark. Noah was a righteous man in his day. Noah stood with God. And I'm saying to somebody, listen, you may be a believer. And you feel as though, you know, you are the only person serving God in your house, in your family, on your job, they're coming against you. I'm saying if you stand for God, God will stand with you. I'm saying in Noah's generation, his family was the only one that was preserved when the flood of God's judgment was uh, meted out on the people of his day. So I'm saying to you, it's not what man says. I'm saying to you what God says. He says, he found favor. He was a righteous man in his generation, in the midst of all the madness. In fact, the Bible says that the heart of man was just evil continually. Every time I read that passage, I'm asking myself, how can the heart of man be evil continually? There is so much more for man's heart to be occupied doing. But when we look at this, this, this world, and what we have become as a people, I can fully well understand. There is so much that the heart of man today is bent on doing that is pure evil. I was looking at a report on Facebook. And, I'm, I'm, you know, sometimes they say these things are not always so. But this, this father, hallelujah, he had his son. He had his son. He was, was beaten. He was starved. Oh, and when he finally died, it's because uh, the report said he bought some pigs and he threw the boy bodies to the pigs. The heart of man, the Bible tells us, is desperately wicked because of sin. And the question is asked, who can really know it? God knows the heart. Amen. He said, look at the heart of man. And God sent a flood of his own choosing. And then when the flood was over, God remembered Noah and God put a rainbow and God says, according to my own power, when I see the rainbow, I will remember that I've made a covenant with you never to destroy the world again like this. Listen to me, no other God has that power. No other authority has that power. No other person has that power. Call them what they may. God alone possesses that kind of supreme power. And of course, we saw God putting provisions in place for mankind to be reconciled, at least to him, until the prescription of Jesus. And let me just jump to that, uh, that passage. Hallelujah. Thank you, God. Where God has made provision. In Exodus 29 verse 36, God says in dealing with sin. And let me tell you, the sovereignty of God means that he alone decides how he will um, be appeased. One, for sin. 
or how atonement will take place for sin. Because some of us still believe that we're going to be good persons. Amen. I've met persons who have refused to serve Jesus, but they are, con they are more um, concerned that, you know what, I give money to the church or I work on the church building or I have allowed the building to be built on my land. But they want no part of Jesus. They want to come to God how they want to come to God. That will not do. God has made a way. Jesus said, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. He says, no man comes to the Father but by me. So any other way we are, we are trying to, to work into God's favor will not work. God said in Exodus 39, 29, 36, Exodus 29, 36, he said, Thou shalt offer every day a bullock for a sin offering. You see what God says? You shall offer every day. That's when the children of Israel had come out of Egypt and now God was setting up order and structure for worship. God had to deal with sin. He says, you shall offer that for me for a sin offering, for atonement. And thou shalt cleanse the altar when thou hast made an atonement for it. And thou shalt anoint it to sanctify it. They were to offer continually sacrifices for sin. That was a temporary provision that God made with his people, the Jews. They would do that with the high priest, Aaron and his sons, and they would bring those animals and they would sacrifice them year after year. This was something that God would accept as the provision to atone for the people's sin. That was, of course, until Jesus Christ came. I'm talking about God's sovereignty in dealing with man's sin, man's transgression. How it is God chooses of his own self to deal with us when we miss the mark. He used bulls. He used animals in the old covenant. But when it came to the period of Jesus Christ, the New Testament, the new covenant. Hear what God's word tells us. Uh, in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 14, it tells us the blood of bulls from verse 13, the blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a heifer sprinkled on those who are ceremonially unclean, sanctify them so that they are outwardly clean. So he was talking about the old practice. He says, how much more then will the blood of Christ, he says, how much more then will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself unblemished to God, cleanse our consciences from acts that lead to death, so that we may serve the living God. He says, if the blood of bulls and goats could have done a little bit of thing, how much more potent is the blood of Jesus Christ, the spotless Lamb of God who came to take away the sin of the world? I keep saying John said, declared boldly when he saw him, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Nothing that we can do, come on, no amount of good life we live can atone for sin. It is only the blood of Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, hallelujah, who came and was sacrificed for our sins is what God will accept. Not only that, with the blood of Christ, but also, hear what verse 22 tells us. In fact, he says the law requires that nearly everything be cleansed with blood. That is what God put in place by his sovereign power to deal with sin. He says, and without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. That is God saying that. God says, uh, um, in fact, Genesis chapter 3, the Bible tells us that when it is Adam and Eve had messed up and they took fig leaves and tried to cover themselves, God is the one who covered them with animal skin. It meant that blood had to be shed for their covering, for their preservation. And it's the same criteria God has used. 
Amen. In fact, Hebrews 10 and 4, hear what it tells us. And I'm winding down. Because he says, it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goat to take away sin. That is why they couldn't do it. Amen. Therefore, when Christ came into the world, he said, sacrifice and offering you did not desire. But a body you prepared for me, verse 6 says, with birth offerings and sin offerings, you were not pleased. God put it in place and still that was, the, that was not the ultimate criteria. He says, then said I, here am I, it is written about me in the scroll. I have come to do your will, O God. And he says in verse 9, then he said, here am I. I have come to do your will. He sets aside the first to establish the second. And by that will, we have been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. How have we been made holy? How have we been reconciled to God? How have we gotten God's approval? It's because now God has chosen to deal with the issue of sin through blood. First, in the Garden of Eden. Second, through the sacrifices that he had um, the Israelites to, to make daily on the altar. And then, God has made the ultimate sacrifice. John 3, 16 and 17 says, For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. God chose to do that. That whosoever believe in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. It says, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Acts 4 and 12 says, there is no other name given among men whereby we must be saved, but the name that is above every other name, Yeshua HaMashiach himself, Jesus. And then Romans 10, 13 tells us, whoever calls upon the name of the Lord, shall be saved. That is the provision God has made for sin in his sovereign power. And I say to you today, will you accept it? Will you say yes to Jesus? Will you call upon that name and be reconciled to God? Hallelujah. And have your sins forgiven. Of course, it's all the time we have for living by the word. We want to encourage you to learn the word, love the word, live the word. Till next time, stay strong. God bless you. Remember, God is sovereign. Bye-bye. This program comes to you compliments of the Tobago Inspirational Network. To support this and other programs, we encourage you to give to TIN. Contributions can be made at any First Citizens Bank at account number 203-4679. We thank you for your support.